गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू ई एस आई टी वी टूडे विथ अस वी हैव डॉ प्रोफेसर मार्टिन रेंके फ्रॉम जर्मनी एंड मैडम रमा वालिया फ्रॉम पी जी आई चंडीगढ़ सो प्रोफेसर मार्टिन विल बी टॉकिंग ऑन इंटरप्रिटिंग रिजल्ट इन ए चैलेंजिंग केस ऑफ कशिंग्स एंड डॉक्टर रमा विल टॉक मोर ऑन द डिफरेंशियल सेंसिटिविटी ऑफ कॉर्टिकोट्रॉफ एडिनोमा वर्सेज द सराउंडिंग टिश्यू सो वील कम टू नो देर सो आई विल स्टार्ट विथ यू प्रोफेसर मार्टिन सो या देर आर मेनी डायग्नोस्टिक कम टू द डायग्नोसिंग ऑफ कशिंग देर आर मेनी डायग्नोस्टिक चैलेंजेस एंड द वन विच इज मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट फॉर एन एंडोक्राइनोलॉजिस्ट और थिंग इज हाउ टू डिफरेंशिएट कशिंग्स फ्रॉम सीडो कशिंग्स दैट इज द मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट सो प्लीज थ्रो सम लाइट that's a very difficult and challenging question that's yeah. actually the question who which subject should be screened and um there are very good data showing that we should not screen every hypertensive patient every female with PCOS every patient with osteoporosis or every diabetic patients because this is uh, these diseases are too frequent and uh, it would um negatively affect test results and uh, patient selection so we have to do a careful patient selection and this is based on i would say four criteria so you look for signs and symptoms of protein degradation you look for skin changes which are quite typical you look for the typical fat distribution and you look for signs and symptoms which are atypical for age and if you say no signs and symptoms up typical for age no fat distribution which is really located here in the uh, in the neck and in the face no signs of protein degradation and also no skin changes then it's not cushing and you shouldn't screen then it's pseudo cushing it's that it's not that simple but it's very important to really that not to screen everybody because this will lead to, to nothing we have to spare our resources for those patients who have a critical indication so a uh, key message is the uh, is the clinical thing and clinical uh, pre test probability what we call should be more that's the that's the key message from it can uh, i ask something so if a patient is having uncontrolled diabetes and because of that there is not typical cushingoid features weight loss is there so patient is actually not obese many a times we see such patients so there even if we are thinking that it may not be cushing and we want to do uh, the screening test two screening test which test will you recommend so you are t- you are speaking about a diabetic patient diabetic type 2 diabetes diabetic patients we are thinking of with uncontrolled resistant hypertension so we are actually thinking of that there is a pre test possibility of cushing is there so if we want to do the two first two tests what do you do okay so i prefer always the 1 mg dex test in a patient who is not taking birth control pill or um having other factors which can affect the cortisol binding and then i prefer the 1 mg dex test um why because it's more sensitive than urinary free cortisol midnight cortisol salivary cortisol is also a good test but in in practice many patients are not doing it exactly as it should be so the logistic is more difficult just to further enhance the discussion because in many cases pseudo cushing ondst 1 mg actually is non suppressible so and then we have to subject the patient to ldst that the uh, two uh, two days test So what is your take on that so should we subject directly such patients to LDDST because ONDST is likely to come non suppressible and LDDST is more discriminatory There's not a there's not a simple uh, uh, answer to that It is not our it's per, not my personal experience that um the 1 mg dex always comes pathological comes definitely, comes abnormal definitely. with zudo cushing that's not true i mean it depends on what we understand with zudo cushing are we talking about depressive patients with Many obesity times. yeah 
well, they of course have uh, are a little bit glucocorticoid resistant and they will have an abnormal test. But still, I mean, we are not, obesity and depression alone is not enough yes. for screening. I wouldn't do that because then you get a pathological result and then what you do then? Sure, that, that's what, because if we are doing ONDST and then we are finding a bit higher than we are supporting yeah, again. Exactly. Yeah. So in a very small study which we published, there we found that LDDST was almost suppressible in all the patients. While ONDST we got a cutoff of around 100. Interesting observation. Yes. So it's the patient-centered approach, LDDST, HDDST. So we'll move on now. Let's say we have diagnosed a Cushing's and then we want to know whether it's ACTS dependent or independent. Now again, there are challenges. What are the cutoffs? And how to, uh, frequently we see, we diagnose, even we diagnose the ACTS dependent and then we do a MRI, we get some uh, small adenoma and then at the end we end up that no, it was ectopic. So, Professor, please throw a light how, how to go about distinguishing. Yeah. So, um, although it sounds simple, it's not that simple, as always with Cushing's. In general terms, everything above 15 picograms per milliliter is ACTH dependent Cushing's. And everything below 10, it's ACTH independent. And then we have the gray zone between 10 and 15. Um, However, one has to admit, if you look into the literature, there are good reports showing that patients with clear-cut adrenal Cushing's have ACTH levels, sometimes suppressed, sometimes a little bit, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then again below 10. So there are fluctuations, point one. One has to keep that into, in mind. Secondly, we have problems with the ACTH assays, especially in the lower normal range. ACTH measurements are not very consistent and differences between assays can be substantial. With one assay, all patients are suppressed. With the other one, you have levels between 10 and 20. So every endocrinologist has to know exactly the assay um, uh, the, the person is using. Thirdly, in critical cases where we cannot decide whether it's adrenal or not adrenal, CIH stimulation can help us. If we have an ACTH increase above 13 following ACTH, uh, CRH stimulation, then, it's, um, then it is not adrenal. Then it is uh, uh, ACTH dependent pushing. So that's my answer. So, yeah, so there are a couple of points which needs to be taken into consideration before that. Now, let's say we have diagnosed and we have treated, but we all know that Cushing's is known for its recurrence and patient need long term follows obviously, but then it comes at which test to follow, how to follow this and where to pick up that initial, yeah, it's starting to recur. So, uh, what's your take on that test to apply for the recurrent Cushing's? The recurrent. Well, there's no prospective trial investigating which test is best. Whether it's urinary, it's clearly not urinary free cortisol. This is coming at the latest. It is, the one milligram DEX test is quite good, but probably salivary cortisol is the best for uh, initial recurrence because it starts to be abnormal quite early on. It doesn't help you to decide what to do with the patient. Let's say, because biochemistry always is first and clinics comes later. Yeah. So then you have a patient, salivary cortisol is elevated, it used to be normal, now it, be it climbs up. What do you do with the patient? Do you send to surgery? No. As long as there are no symptoms, no. So you calm the patient down and say, well, come next year or come if you develop symptoms because then it's time to to decide what to do uh, just to add to this so we do uh, late night plasma cortisol routinely and we do it on opd basis we have published a study where we used late night plasma cortisol on opd ba basis versus after admission and we found different cutoffs but even opd basis was good enough to rule out hypercortisolism so we are doing it routinely. So in the patients who are having recurrence, what 
our data shows that that 11 pm cortisol actually is the first one to rise we do not go for salivary cortisol because the assay is not well standardized so many times we get high yeah. values but plasma cortisol is good enough and that actually the cut off of less than 50, uh, 105 actually rules out hypercortisolism and this is the one which starts rising and as you have said that even if it is rising until unless the patient has some features we are not even if we investigate we may not find anything further so we just wait till the sign and symptoms appear or the cortisol is definitely in the uh, higher range okay yeah good strategy so yeah we came to know few strategies how to deal with it now we'll move to the cushing's disease per se and the cortitotrop adenoma now previously it was thought that yeah there is a adenoma and the surrounding tissue is absolutely normal but now we know that no there is some differential sensitivity dr rama will guide us on that what's exactly the differential sensitivity of so what we are actually thinking on it is that there is a there are nascent corticotrophs okay. and because of certain mutations a corticotropinoma arises so what happens is it is a relatively resistant cells which are arising from the normal corticotrophs yeah. in which the negative feedback is at a higher point but the positive feedback is actually up regulated so there is under uh, under suppression then we do dexamethasone suppression test but when we do stimulation test the crh stimulation test it up, that is up regulated so uh, because of that there is growth of the adenoma yeah. and the this differences between the corticotropinoma versus surrounding corticotrophs can help us clinically in deciding which patients are likely to develop nelson adenoma post yeah. adrenalectomy or which patients are going to remain in remission this this is all totally clinical data which suggests this so uh, yeah so please let us know what is the its clinical implication for this in uh, developing remission so uh, so for uh, cushing when we were analyzing our data of cushing disease we found that the patient who actually came early had lesser lag time had more severe phenotype like they were having more likely uh, more having proximal myopathy more having diabetes so they were having severe phenotype and of course this is a well known fact that after surgery lower the day 3 cortisol longer the hydrocort requirement then they remain in remission so both these factors the previous one says that the disease phenotype is more severe and the second one says that the corticotropinoma and the surrounding corticotrophs both are suppressed so these two factors along with disappearance or absence of diabetes and hypertension post operatively which again says that the cortisol burden has been withdrawn says the patient will remain in remission and for this we developed a score cushing disease uh, remission predictor okay. and we made an app also uh. so uh, but then is it only the disease it's, it happens in all the diseases more severe the disease is uh. more are the chances of the patient will go into remission yeah. but we went and looked at the cortisol levels yeah. the cortisol levels which between the patients who went into remission versus who had persistent disease or relapses were same, same. the oh. cortisol ondst ldst yeah. stdst all these levels were same yeah. in the patients who had remission or who were not in the remission okay. so probably there the role of cortisol sensitivity comes yeah. the patients who are having who are more cortisol yeah. sensitive yeah. are likely to remain in remission yeah. and yeah. then we pick can pick up this cortisol sensitivity yeah. from the behavior of the surrounding corticotrophs and at the somatic cell levels okay. like somatic cell levels more of the proximal myopathy yeah. more of diabetes yeah. shorter lag time probably predicts remission so yeah in terms of cortisol level it was same but to predict remission yeah there is something like differential sensitivity has to be picked up great so uh, now what about its implications in development of nelson syndrome so uh, nelson adenoma probably uh, is actually a feedback sensitive tumor okay uh, patient is having a corticotropinoma we are subjecting because of one or the other reason to adrenalectomy yeah. as soon as the steroid burden is taken out yeah. there is growth of the adenoma but it doesn't develop in everyone it yeah. develops in almost 40% of the patients uh, who develop um, who have cushing disease and we are subjecting them to yeah. adrenalectomy so do we have a predictor for that yeah. so what we found the patients who developed nelson syndrome had more severe um, proximal muscle weakness had more frequently discriminatory features of protein catabolism okay. in um, than the patients who did not develop nelson syndrome okay. then post operatively hmm. the patients who developed nelson syndrome had had more rebound of acth as compared to 
who yeah. did not have Nelson syndrome, which is a well-known fact. Yeah. But we found definite cutoff for the first year rise, for the annual rise of around 116 picogram per ml, that the, this patient is likely to develop Nelson syndrome. So we again started thinking, what is the reason? And then we again went back and looked at the cortisol level. And surprisingly, again, the cortisol levels in, in the subjects who developed Nelson syndrome versus the subjects who did not develop Nelson syndrome were same. Cortisol, ONDST, LDDST were same. But ACTH at baseline was a bit lower although not statistically significant in patients who developed Nelson syndrome and the rebound was higher. So there was there is something which keeps the tumor suppressed yeah. uh, and as soon as we take out the adrenals yeah. there is growth of the adenoma. So probably who the subjects this uh, are having more of cortisol sensitivity okay. yeah. they are likely that they are more symptomatic and once we take off their adrenals they are more likely to develop Nelson adenoma. So, if we can pick up this uh, differential sensitivity, you mean perhaps we can offer them radiotherapy early, perhaps, yes. or we can put them on higher dose of suppressible Let's see. Excellent. So, uh, yeah, so all we all have seen that Cushing's managing is not so easy and it will never be, but definitely both of our speakers have added uh, great insights into that. I like to thank both of them for the same.